Hello and welcome to our Six Nations coverage brought to you by the TW2 team. Normally, you'll find us where you listen to your favourite podcast, but over the next five rounds, you get to see our lovely faces. And the other huge, exciting announcement is that for one week and one week only, we are changing the name of the show to the EH12 podcast, and that is because of the fantastic Calcutta Cup result that saw Scotland retain it for the third year in a row. My name is Fergus Mainland, and I am in esteemed company to review all of the action of round one of Rugby's Greatest Championship. I'm joined in the studio by Imogen Ainsworth, Caleb Matomba, and James Price. And Imogen, we'll start with that blockbuster at Twickenham. Who were some of the standout players for you in the Colcutter Cup? I think I have to start with Dio van der Moe. I gave him a nine on my player ratings. I think he was brilliant. Made 104 metres, um, 55 metres in that one try. Um, hardly, so that's hardly surprising. Left every defender in the dust. Um, kind of really took in England's defence to pieces. I also um, had Matt Ferguson on an eight. He made 26 tackles and missed none which is pretty impressive. Luke Crosby as well, on his third cap, made 20 tackles and missed none, which is very good as well. Um, England, Lewis Adlam had a great game. I thought he was kind of everywhere, had a great work rate um, throughout. Um, a well-timed offload as well from him, set Max Malins' uh, second try, and he made 18 carries. Owen Farrell wasn't too impressed with at 12. He, he was all right, I gave him a 5.5, I think. Five, actually, not the point five. <laughs> um, missed two out of three conversions, which is quite unlike Farrell from, from the tee. Um, put some big hits on Finn Russell, although they were slightly late, a few of them. And there was a little bit of um, banter, so to speak, going on between the two, a bit of pushing and shoving and, uh, and such. Um, Hassel Collins, I don't think, had the most exciting of debuts. Looked a bit nervous at times. Um, he did manage to restore that kind of token and roar that Steve's spoken about when he when he got the ball a few times. Kind of heard the crowd kind of go up, which was quite nice. Um, Max Malins gave an eight as well. I think he was impressive. Obviously, two tries for him as well. Um, showed that skill and pace that we've seen from him in the Premiership before. And there was also a point where he chipped the ball forwards twice in a row, second pass Stuart Hogg, nearly leading to a, another try. And I was really impressed by him. Um, Kind of fives and sixes uh, elsewhere for most players. Ben White gave a 7.5, another try scorer. I um, think he was composed and managed the game quite well. Jack Mont Portfleet, England's nine as well. Um, I think he got a 6.6, six, not 6.5. Um, he made a, uh, 87 passes, which I think was the highest uh, in that game and was the highest, uh, yeah, was the highest in that game. Um, box kicking wasn't at its strongest, but I think he definitely had a better performance than we saw in that shocker against New Zealand when they really just targeted him, obviously mm. a different opposition. But yeah, I think stuff to improve on for next week, but it was quite a good game of rugby to watch, I thought. Mm. And James, potentially one of those areas to improve on uh, was probably the centre partnership. There's been a lot of discussion about Marcus Smith and Owen Farrell at 10 12, but potentially one of the big holes that England had in their defence was their, was their centre combination. Yeah, it's all the chat is about uh, Marcus Smith and Owen Farrell at 12, this 10-12 combination that somehow we can't quite get to work. But what doesn't seems a bit nonsensical really is that we're not talking about that, part, that centre partnership. We saw for Scotland how good Huey Pilotti was, <laughs> obviously. Um, they're, they're club mates as well, so they played with each other plenty. Uh, and we saw for that try where, where uh, Tua Pelosi kicked it through for Hugh Jones, they, they have that connection. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if that's something, you know, it's just not tangible. You can't, it's something that you build over time without even realising. But we saw for that try, uh, the first try, where, um, where Hugh Jones made the break again through that six, seven, eight metre gap between Owen Farrell uh, and Joe Marchant, that maybe the connection hasn't built there. I don't know whose fault that is. It's not really... You know, selection with Manu Tilang, he's mm -hmm. traditionally taken up a place in that centre. He wasn't there. Uh, so, you know, it's just something, hopefully, that we can finally have a decision on the Farrell-Smith debate and finally maybe get a bit more balance in that, in that back line for yeah, England. Certainly things to improve on for the next outing against Italy. Um, but Imogen, you were in the stadium. There was obviously a huge amount of discussion and frustration about Twickenham's atmosphere back mm -hmm. in the Autumn Nations. They were obviously booed off 
uh, in their final game of the Autumn Nation series. How did Twickenham sound in the Calcutta Cup? I must say, um, England were outsung on quite a few occasions by Scotland, um, as they were out, outplayed as well. Um, but on the whole, there were no, no booing from what I can remember hearing. I had ref link in one ear and was kind of trying <laughs> to listen in the other. Um, but yeah, swing low being sung again. Slightly controversial, but at least they were making some noise of some description, which was quite nice. Um, yeah, it was just nice to be back. Things seemed a bit different. I haven't been to an England game since 2014, I think. But the buzz compared to the autumn and the discussions, especially post-match, um, definitely weren't about, oh, the, the crowd booed us. It was kind of, we need to talk about the crowd because that wasn't a factor that really mm -hmm. had an impact on the game, which is quite nice. Yeah, a fantastic performance from Scotland. Sees them win the Colcaster Cup for the third year in a row. A huge result for Gregor Townsend and and a really strong performance he's been stringing together with this Scotland team. He's certainly got the, uh, the number of, of England over the past few years. But what we'll do is we'll shift on to the earlier game from Saturday, Caleb, and that was Ireland away to Wales in a closed roof Principality Stadium. Warren Gatlin's first outing, first outing, I should say, since his return. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who were, what were some of the standout moments for you in that, um, in that Ireland-Wales game? I think it's a given that Ireland were really on par. They played good rugby, but they were still looking like a team that's 20% off their best, so there's still more to come from this Irish team. But Wales failed to adapt. The first 20 minutes, they got pinned three times for not rolling away when the score was a little bit close. Fell it out twice, as well as Dan Bigger. Which then questions, is it maybe a team that's trying to adjust between systems because Warren Gatland hasn't had enough time with them? but it's still his boys that he picked. So most of those players he's coached before in that red jersey. And that's one thing I saw. And when the intercept pass went, and you could see Dan Bigger trying to chase, you could see that it was one or two, two of those notches away from wherever he was trying to chase. So are they a squad that's two or three, four years older than they need to be? We know what a world side that's got their walls behind the back and they need to come back with Gatlin and that emotional boost that he can give them and see what they can do next week. But they were, they were, they were looking like a team that's really not on international rugby standard as opposed to a well-drilled, well-executing island team. Mm. And you touched on just a couple of things you need to improve on. What specifically would you like to see from this Wales team in the next round of the, of the competition? Or do you think this new look Wales team is here to stay? So the first thing that I was quite shocked about was their inability to be stable at set-piece. We've known Gatlin teams, they're quite stable at set-piece. They got bullied a little bit on the scrum uh, with the Irish back, your end reporters, as well as in the loose, when you talk the loose inside the breakdown, James Ryan, they were, they were bossing that area, Josh van der Fleer. So you'd like to see a wall side that can stand up and not get bullied, something we used to associate Scotland with, but it <laughs> didn't happen this weekend, it happened to Wales. So that's the first thing. The second thing, they were attacking from too deep. They did not create enough crisis corridors for the defense. Dan Bigger was a bit standoffish receiving the ball. Not so sure what that is. Hopefully they can maybe take it a little bit up. He's been known to be a 10 that takes it closer to the line, doesn't he? But he wasn't that Dan Bigger on the weekend. Yeah. So Ireland looking particularly hot after that game in Cardiff. And it sets up what will be a fascinating fixture against France in Dublin next weekend. But James, speaking of France, they had the final game of the weekend, a trip to Rome, certainly one of the favourite venues of the Six Nations, and it was a nail-biter, wasn't it? What did you think of, of that performance from them? It was. Well, you know, France extend their win streak to 14 games. They come away with a bonus point. They scored four brilliant tries. Thibaut Flamand with that charge down early on. The cross field uh, from Untermac to uh, De Mortier. Jalibert with an amazing try at the end. But it wasn't really that straightforward, was it? <laughs> yeah. It sounds great when you say it like that, but it really wasn't that straightforward. First of all, there was a humongous penalty count, one that I haven't seen in a long time. 18 penalties. They had nine penalties mm. to two in the first half against Italy, which is just absolutely mad. I think um, Sean Edwards was saying that he's, he's obviously been a defensive coach for 20-odd years and he's never seen a penalty count that high. Um, maybe it's down to them, maybe it's down to Matthew Carley. He was, he was very careful with his words about the referees, saying, I oh, will go through it with the referees. So who knows? I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave that one up to my refereeing friend to my right here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think one thing is, obviously, France came back and scored that try to ensure the win for them. The one thing you can, must say is this last gasp win thing that France keep doing, they keep doing it. <laughs> they did it against Australia in the autumn. Mm. 
uh, and they've done it again now and uh, there must be other instances I can't think of the top of my head but what, I think it's becoming a trait right mm. because the whole trope used to be ah oh, these are the games that France don't win yeah. but they're winning these games now and they keep doing it interesting you say about the last cup last cast to um, Australia, Italy obviously beat Australia in the autumn exactly. as well, which is just interesting when you compare the performance against France and the way mm. they, you know, they beat them and, and mm. yeah. They both yeah, exactly. Them. But fr from an Italy perspective as well, obviously Rome wasn't built in a day, so we've got to give them <laughs> a little bit of, uh, of wiggle room in terms of their, de in their development. But you were saying off air, uh, we just want to see Italy mm. compete, right? Yeah. We, just want to, we don't necessarily need them to win games. We just want to see them compete. And to sit there on a Sunday uh, in a France v Italy game and halfway through the result isn't uh, decided yet, mm. that is great mm. for this competition. Hugely. I think it kind of shuts up those, you know, kick, it, kick Italy out kind of mm. rumours that we've had conversations that have been going on recently with the likes of Georgia, etc. But for them to actually be able to put up a very strong performance, I think is definitely positive for them on the competition as mm. well. For sure. Yeah, you talk about that Italian side. They they liked something in terms of taking the right option at the right time. For example, that box kick that got charged down. Mm. It's something that a Paolo Gabisi who's looking back, he's known for playing two, three phases ahead of time, more like a George Ford type of a fly half, which they seem to lack. So they took wrong options. They were reluctant to kick the ball out to clear it when they were in their own 22 and under the pump. And it's said that it was a very good French side. It's a fully packed French side in Tamak Dupong. Guy Fink, everybody was in there. And I think it's a side that's well coached. It's a side that know how to win games they're not playing well in. And we've seen that teams that go out and, and dominate the world in terms of rugby, they do that. The Red Roses, you look at the All Blacks of old, and this French side has got a knack of winning games that they're out of it. You look at that tour to Japan with, mm. without their stars, they did the same thing. Mm. So it's, it's interesting how they played next week when they go to Dublin. Yeah. Certainly. So we have looked over three fantastic opening games of the Six Nations Championship and we've touched on Scotland's victory over England as well. But what is the Calcutta Cup? What is this famous trophy? Well, we took a trip along to the World Rugby Museum at Twickenham Stadium to learn more about the trophy. After last night's victory over England, Scotland retained the Calcutta Cup for the third year in a row. But what is the famous trophy? The Calcutta Cup is one of several smaller trophies that are contested between some of the teams during the Six Nations Championship. And we've come along to the World Rugby Museum here at Twickenham Stadium to find out a bit more. And as for the cup itself, here it is. When the Calcutta Football Club disbanded in 1877, they had 270 silver Indian rupees left in their bank account. So that they might make a lasting contribution to the game, the club chose to melt the coins down and refashion the metal as a football trophy. The following year, the Calcutta Cup was presented to the RFU and they decided that it would be given to the winners of the annual contest between Scotland and England. During the Calcutta Cup, England have been dominant over the years, retaining the Cup 82 times compared to Scotland's 47. However, in recent years, Scotland have flipped the script and have retained the trophy five out of the last six meetings between the teams. Under Gregor Townsend, Scotland have built a dynasty in the Calcutta Cup over the past few years. However, England are now under new leadership. Is Steve Borthwick the man to turn around England's poor runner form in the Calcutta Cup? Only time will tell. Well, wasn't that a fantastic piece there all about the Calcutta Cup? And now what we're going to do is move on to our section we are calling Views from the Press Box, where we take a look at some of the big headlines to come out of the opening weekend of the Six Nations. And Imogen, we're going to start with you first of all, because you were actually in the press box at Twickenham for the Calcutta Cup. And you're actually going to go through one of your pieces that you've put together about Marcus Smith. Yeah, so Marcus Smith came down to the mix zone um, after the game, said a few interesting things. Um, he said he felt himself in an England shirt. Um, 
wouldn't comment either way whether he didn't feel himself in the past, but said he felt good, he felt really clear going into the game, felt that their plan was engraving them throughout the week, um, and that they made a good start, which I think is really telling given that they've only had 11 days, I think, with their coaches, mm. um, that that plan and what their coaches wanted from them was really set in stone and that they knew that going into the game. Um, he said, I felt good out there, I wasn't thinking, I was in the game, which I think is important that a player knows their direction, there were points in the autumn where I felt players weren't really sure what to do and weren't sure what the direction was and, and what was going on. Obviously, a big um, part of the coaching team is Nick Evans from Harlequins, who's joined England for the Six Nations, but I'm sure yet whether this will carry on post-Six Nations. Obviously, he's also a coach at Harlequins, so Marcus has spent a lot of time with him um, over the years, and he said that being able to work with Nick Evans at this level is brilliant and that they have a good relationship and he feels like he can challenge Nick and be challenged by him, which improves his game. Um, another thing he spoke about was his partnership with Owen Farrell um, in the centres, which we spoke about before as well. It's been quite a hotly contested topic around England fans um, of late. Yeah, that's one way of putting it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, one way. You mentioned quite a lot. Um, but yeah, he said... When he first started playing with Andre at Quinns, it took them 30, 40 games to kind of get this connection. I think, I'm not sure on the stats of how many games uh, Owen and Marcus have played at that combination. I think it's around seven. Yeah. Um, so it's really not very many. And when you look at the bigger picture, how long it took with Andre, obviously England haven't got 30, 40 games. We've got very few games left until the World Cup. But he said that him and Owen get really well, get on really well on and off the field. Um, he also said it's not about them. I think they're kind of a bit sick of this talk and they just want to get out and play where they've been told to play. But an interesting um, comparison is Andre Estazen is much physically bigger than Aaron Powell in that 12 shirt. Um, but Smith didn't seem worried by this. He said, we've got powerful wingers. You know, Oli Hassa Collins is a powerful runner. He said, Joe March is really strong. Max, Ma Max Maylands is clever with his running lines. And he also mentioned weapons. So he said, we've got weapons and it's my job to try and find the best way to shoot our weapons and I'm still learning. You have to still keep in mind, he's only nearly 24. So on Valentine's Day, he turns 24. So he's still relatively young um, mm. in, this, in this squad. So that was an interesting bit for me, just hearing um, the way he spoke in the mix zone. I think um, he said, obviously, it's still disappointing to lose, but they, they felt good and they felt positive, which I think for any England fan... Well, any sensible England fan, and for Steve Borthwick, that's where we need to be at the moment. They need to be in a position where, okay, they lost, they've had 11 days together, but we need to think, okay, well, there's some positives we can take. I think the attack was much better than in the autumn, um, and that showed. And it's just, I think those partnerships need a bit more time to mould. I don't know how they're going to be able to do that in that short time, but yeah, I think that's something that could definitely be worked on. But I think for now, we can stop the conversations about. Mm -hmm. I think it's just oh I'm sure they'll keep going on but yeah. I suppose that would, I think that suggests that um, Steve Borthwick Kevin Sinfield Nick Evans they'll be looking to use that off weekend that we have in the Six Nations now as a huge advantage to them to them to try and build some sort of uh, cohesion between between the two of them and James that England talk continues into uh, the the piece that you've picked out um, what have you got for us well, I had to rely on the eyes and ears of Mr. Will Kelleher from the Times um, as I was not there in person myself. However, uh, he did pick up some very interesting quotes from Steve Borthwick, who basically said that he inherited a team that weren't good at anything. So he was straight to the mark, exactly yeah. what his point. Um, in the live section as well, so exactly. broadcast for everyone. Yeah, it sounds very provocative. Sounds like he's having a go at Eddie Jones, but realistically, he's not. I think he's just trying to put into context, like Emma was saying, they've had 11 days together. At, in the autumn, <clears throat> they had the worst scrum of any of the Tier 1 mm. nations. And we know how big a thing England's scrums have been in the past in terms of a centre for attack. Mm. And we haven't got that. And he's just putting that into context. I think that's completely fair. You can yeah, wait a second because <laughs> <laughs> I know you're going to come at me. I am. Um, he's also talking about speed, like ruck speed was really low as well. And they said they've already seen improvements um, this weekend. But like I'm saying, it's just going to take time. And Which we can we just say, <laughs> exactly, we don't have. But as an England fan, it was so much better to see that game on the weekend. It felt like something new. It felt like at least we were trying something slightly different rather than hammering at the same door that we were before. So that was my piece for this week. Well, they're still hammering at the uh, 
Kolkata Cup losing Dora. Gregor, <laughs> Gregor <laughs> Townsend had a, so, a nice quote in the uh, in the post match. He said, Duan's like a, a player on Joan Lomi rugby when they can suddenly go much faster than everyone else, which mm-hmm. I thought was summed it up quite nicely because he could suddenly go a lot faster than mm. everyone else. Indeed. Yeah, it's it's an interesting piece there by Mr. Kelha James where he talks about Steve Borthwick inheriting a team that's not good at anything. I think it's important to note that he was Eddie Jones' longest serving assistant. So much, and he was the forwards coach, and those are things that they didn't do well this weekend, with the exception when he moved to Leicester. And he wasn't that, there for a year and a half, but he, it he went was, downhill they were after quite he good. left. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let me finish. He was in that system, but I also think that they need to start looking forward. So you could have phrased that better. I agree with all his sentiments, but I don't think with how close we are in the World Cup is the mindset you want to drill that oh we weren't good at anything for the past two years when you've got about six or seven games before you play an all-important quarterfinal in the World Cup. I think so if I, you look at the statistics, which was what he was genuinely looking at, he wasn't just making a comment. He looked at the stats and went, we are not comparing yeah, we were literally nations. the worst scrum. They literally were. I think we had the ninth, the ninth best denying that. ruck speed. I just, I'm just not accepting framing that under the previous regime because you're the men in the driving seat now and the things that he needs to improve as his coach because he knows what they're not good at. So it's like, we didn't do too well on the scrums. We need to improve. I don't think he ever... Not that I can recall. I was obviously a very busy day, but I don't think he ever said that, like, he particularly inherited it. He just said, we like, England weren't good at this before I came in, which is what I remember him saying. I don't remember him actually picking Eddie Jones out and being like, oh, it's all Eddie's All fault. he said is, weren't good at anything, specifically. Yeah. That's that's my I, I, interpretation of it. I thought that England attacked better than they have in a long time. Yeah. Um, I thought they did, and I thought the smith Farrell combination is coming to fruition. What I had an issue with was their defensive pattern, which takes eight to nine games yeah. when a new coach takes over to try and pin down. But coming out of Wales, Fergus, is Warren Gatlin having to make big decisions in terms of his selection. He selected the boys that is known, mm-hmm. George North. He also said Leah Penny before he pulled mm-hmm. out your Talupe Felitaus, your Liam Williams, your Josh Adams, Ken Owens. These are the boys he knows. He's won Grand Slams with them. He's won a Six Nations before with them in terms of the core of that squad. And very few of them went well this past weekend. And we know he's not afraid of big calls. Is he going to make the calls and bring in the youngsters? Which he said he was quite disappointed in his camp that there weren't enough youngsters who were given a chance to take part in the international game and be ready for such games. So the question is, does Warren Gatland go nuclear and give the kids a go? Because you're <laughs> going to need a squad at the World Cup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If what happens if George um, if George North is not fit at 13 and Liam Williams and both Liam Penny are not available for a match, so he's gonna have to have players that are ready to to take part. So we've seen him make big calls, dropping Johnny Sexton for the Lions, or 2013 not picking Brian O'Driscoll. So he does have the guts to make big calls, and I'd love him to make good calls because I don't think they win the Six Nations anyways. A question I have for you on that: Does he have the resources to pick young players in all of those positions? We spoke before about the Welsh club game, are there standout players in the Welsh club game that he can be picking for those positions? Good question. And I think the the answer to that is Wales are probably missing a generation of players Mm. because you've got that Ken Owens Mm. and George North bracketed of players in that generation. Then it goes all the way down to Tommy Lothar. There isn't something in the middle there. It's like 27, 28, 29 area. No, they just yeah. don't have. They have the, the early 19 30s. 19-year-olds. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. They've got the Jack Morgan era and that load of people. And the but, Rio Dyer. Mm. There's a huge gap of players that are missing. And I think it's testament to the mess that Walsh Rugby has been for the past years. And I'm not so sure if the bus is faulty and they change the driver. <laughs> <laughs> So that was the view from the press box and it's a trip that we will be making every round of the championship to see what some of the standout headlines are throughout the Six Nations. But now what we're going to do is take a look at some of the key tactical moments and break down some of those in our next section, Talking Tactics. On this week's edition of Talking Tactics, I'm joined by Caleb Matumbwa and we're going to be going through some incredible Scotland attack, but also some of the defensive frailties that England suffered at the weekend. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about their defensive wars there. And I think it's a good distinction to make that the difference between defense and tackling. So they miss a lot of penalty, a lot of tackles, sorry, they had 25 missed tackles, which is 80% tackle success rate because they've got system errors in their defense. Not necessarily that they're not tackling, but you find people are being caught in two minds because of the system and they don't want to reach for the tackle, then that tackle is missed. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump first into this first try that Scotland scored uh, the weekend. Uh, and it all starts with a line-out from George Turner. 
which you can't see on this slide here, but just before here, George Turner throws the line out over the top. 100% uh, success rate on their line out, by the way, this weekend. Uh, that goes to Jamie Ritchie. And Jamie Ritchie finally gets out here to Finn Russell, who's ready to find uh, a dangerous looking Hugh Jones on the line here. Uh, but yeah, basically, right here, we can see Finn Russell getting ready to bring in some of these England's attackers. If you see Owen Farrell right here, he is already committed onto Finn Russell at 10. And Caleb, that's not what we want to see at this point in the game. Yeah, and it's an important point you make that he's already committed. If you look at that blue line, you see the Scottish attacker there hasn't made a decision where he's going. He's still squaring up before he gets the ball. So Finn Russell has two, three options at the back before he passes that ball. So if we move on to the next slide, we can see what happens when Farrell overcommits. And here he is. He's massively disconnected. And you can see that gap with that white line between him and Joe Marchant. He's dived in onto Finn Russell's bait with his little dummy and pass. And Hugh Jones is ready to burst through that hole, isn't he? But I've got a question. It might not be a Farrell issue as well. It might also be a Marcus Smith defensive communication issue. Because if Marcus tells Farrell, I've got your inside, go then Farrell doesn't have to commit there. Then mm. Joe Marchant can keep calling him, come, come, come. So it, it exposes Owen Farrell a bit there, which might be a system error. And I think it's good on Finn Russell. He, he holds it and he holds it mm. to make sure that Farrell bites. Some of them is not, one of them is not communicating. The question is, is it Owen Farrell or is it Marcus Smith who's not telling him to slide? Yeah, that's obviously one of the things I'm sure Steve Orthic will be looking at during the week. Uh, but regardless, what happens is we see Hugh Jones bursting through this line and on the next slide, we'll see uh, Scotland up on the five metre line for England. And if you see that circle there near the base of the post, that is a Ben White looped pass on its way to Sione Tuipilotti. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point because if you also look at the way they are set up, if you look at that circle where the ball is circled, and if you look at where Tuipilotti is circled, you see that on the left hand side of the post, you've got one, two, Murray Toji and them in his scrum cap. One, two, three, four five, six, seven England defenders that are out of the game. And then what you then see is Scotland having two pilots circled there. He still has two options outside him, which he can still go wide. So the ability to condense that English defense, phenomenal. And if you see what happens next is two Pilotu is going to take this ball above his head, as you can see right here. And he is in that white space there, realized that there is a whole load of space behind this English line that have rushed up. In many ways, I don't know what Ben White was trying to do with that pass, but the, this floated pass has created this England defence to rush up and made this space behind him. Already, the dead ball line, or the dead ball area, sorry, at Twickenham is so large that he has spotted a brilliant hole there. And as we can see, both of these centres are ready to pounce on it. They're ready to pounce, and you've done so well there by highlighting that open space. is a space where we call the crisis corridor. Nobody's covering, mm. which forces a lot of the defence. Oh, we've got two below the outside. You've got Marcus Smith somebody else on, in, on his inside, somebody else there trying to come back in. So they're biting a lot and not trusting the men on the outside to make the right decision. Yeah, and as we can see seconds later, uh, we're going to have Lewis Ludlam, who had a brilliant game, making a perfect tackle, but already Tuipilotu has managed to bring that ball down. He's managed to get it on his foot and put it into that hole. And as we can see here, Caleb, on that blue arrow, uh, again, Hugh Jones is already taking off. He knew that his centre partner was going to find that space back there. Yeah, you talk about an attack moving like an orchestra, being conducted by Finn Russell as the choir master, knowing exactly what needs to happen when. And it's brilliant, even if Duan van der Merwe lurking behind, that if that option is not there, it can go to Duan as well out of the back door. So brilliant Scottish stack attack, we call it. Yeah. So overall, really, it's sort of a, a brilliant attempt from Tuipilotu there, a great piece of skill. But ultimately, it all came from a defensive frailty from England, didn't it? Yeah, it's a system error, and they need to fix that in terms of communication from the onset in that first picture that you showed us. Marcus Smith needs to tell Owen Farrell to go, 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 go. I've got inside, I've got inside. We always talk about the jam one slide. So you jam, then you tell the next person to slide. So there needs to be a bit more better comms there. Indeed. Um, and this wasn't the first time we saw an England frailty during this game. And in a further try that Scotland scored as well, later in the game, it was actually the last try that uh, Duan van der Merwe scored near the end of the game. We see similar problems. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll see... Uh, oh, there's Hugh Jones scoring. Sorry, we've missed that one already. <laughs> but that's okay. So as we can see on this side, this comes... Uh, this is in the 74th minute now, right towards the edge of the game. Um, and we can see a ruck formed here on the right-hand side in the, inside the 15-metre channel. And that's after Carl Sain has just made a break 
down that side. And as we can see, in that tiny circle, how many England players can you see in there? One, two, three, four, five. Five England players. You've got That's one, right. two, three, four Scottish players, but the fifth one is on his feet, ready to channel that attack again. So again, getting condensed in that small circle of defense. Yeah, and talking about condensed, if we just see the pass that's going to be made from the base of this ruck now over to Finn Russell, if we just look at how many defenders have been taken out by this. It's the obvious, like we said, those five in the ruck. And out to Finn Russell now, uh, there is now 10 inactive, essentially, or uh, English defenders who aren't able to uh, influence the defence. And that is obviously not good enough in a 15-on-15 game. No, that's that's definitely not good enough. But if you also look at the alignment of the Scottish attacking there, it's it's another, I'm saying this word a lot today, it's a stack attack where they're looking at the, at the defence and they're forcing them to commit. Mm. You've got to make a decision as a defender. But also, there, in, there isn't that many defenders to make a decision because we've counted eight already. I think Murray Torge is lurking behind there. I don't know what he's doing mm -hmm. there. Taken out by that pass. And then what we're going to see next is an absolutely perfect pass from Finn Russell. If you just watch this blue line here, that ball is already in the air. And uh, the, running, the running on uh, sub, which is Fraser Brown, the, the substitute hooker, is, as you will see slowly, he's going to perfectly line up with that ball. Um, here you are. So Fraser Brown takes that ball. And once again, unfortunately, it's Mr. Owen Frowell that we're, we're focusing on again. He is trying to cover uh, this. And this pass is about to go out to... Um, out to it's uh, Richie Gray, isn't it? Uh, and if we see, if we just pop back one slide again, we'll see where, if you have a look over there, on the far right side on that white line, there is Max Malins out there on the 15 meter. If we go back one slide more, what we'll see is, sorry, if we go forward one slide more, if you don't mind, uh, we will see how Max Malins has moved there. And he's got a tough decision there to make, doesn't he? Because he's either got to go and take man and ball, or he's got to track back and try and hold Dan van der Merwe as much as he can. So I think Max Malins should trust his inside more instead of him going for the read because it's still on the 22-meter line. If he was close to the try line, where is maybe close to the 5-meter line where the white box ends, then you want him to make a read. You want mm -hmm. him to make a decision. I suggest that what he does, he touch lines. That's what we call it. Yes. He should touch line and trust his inside man to cross cover and take that person because mm -hmm. we always call better they eat the meters out mm -hmm. than you make a decision early and not make the tackle. Exactly. So and I think well, that is exactly why our, our good friend Alex, our graphics creator, has put in that that line there. That is exactly where we believe that Max Mellin should be going. It's a one on four, and yes. he decides to go for man and ball. And speaking of covering defence, we can see just on the inside here is Owen Farrell having a little nibble at Fraser Brown. There, Fraser Brown has taken the ball to the line, and instead of trying to cover this far corner. Own Fowl's having a little nibble there. It's probably not the best idea for him to do in the 75th minute. Yeah, we, we talk about two types of defense when, when you're talking numbers. The first one is when you're short of numbers, you want to buy time. And you can only buy time by cutting across the touchline. But if you've got equal numbers, then you want to cut down space. He didn't do either, did he? Yeah. He was caught in two minds. But again, Scotland still has options. If you look at that big square, crisis corridor, word of the day, mm -hmm. he still has enough options to say the grabber is on. The pass not to Duan van der Merwe, or he can come back back door. It's still there's still space for him to go because Marcus Smith is already trekking back to try and touch line there and cross cover. Indeed. Options for Scotland, and of course Richie Gray executes a perfectly catch pass uh, here up to Matt Ferguson, who's on the wing. And if we skip on to the next one, we'll see that Matt Ferguson makes the decision to give the ball to Duan van der Merwe nice and early. How important was that for this try? I think that's what we call typical heads up <laughs> rugby. A typical forward would have probably wanted to have a go maybe draw and then pass it. Mm -hmm. But it's, a, it's an absolute good skill. We need to mention that he's also passing to the left. And Duan van der Merwe doesn't have to slow down to catch that ball. He catches that ball on the pace, on the line, and it gives him enough time to adjust his body height and muscle his way through the touchline. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, a, that's good passing skill. When New Zealand was beating everybody else, their forwards could pass left and right as skillful as some of the backline players can. Yeah. And we can learn one or two from the Scottish. And then we see Van der Merwe picking up a little bit of pace with the ball, and then he uses that incredible left-to-right step. We saw it three times yeah. in that try that he scored earlier, the absolute worldie from 55 metres. And here, once again, he's absolutely sent both Marcus Smith and Owen Frow, who I think we've talked about a little bit too much maybe on this show today. Uh, but obviously, his pace going down there, hitting that left-to-right means that they are, just don't have time to slow their feet don't have time to tackle him and then just, you know, make them look very silly. And there he is crossing the line 
to take the Calcutta Cup victory for Scotland. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. He was he was good with ball in hand. Even in the first try, we saw him change hands and shove off the defender. This one, he does well because he knows he's in a powerful position and he carries into the English defence there that are in ones and twos, trying to make a decision and trying to do a dominant tackle. Obviously, with that guy who's as powerful as he is, as quick as he is, is going to bundle over the try line. Yeah, I guess we say overall, this is probably a, a try that's more to Scotland's credit than the first one. The first one might be an English defensive area, but it all stems for me from that uh, ruck speed from Stain right at the start. After that Stain, um, after that Stain run, the ruck speed we were looking at it in analysis earlier. It's what two seconds maximum. Pick up that ball, Farrell gets it wide, and that all creates it in the other corner for Dion van der Merwe. Yeah, and I think it might be credit to Gregor Townsend in terms of his scrum of choice. The scrum of is is also quite instrumental in making sure that that drag speed moves because he didn't always want to touch the ball mm -hmm. when he was late to the breakdown. He allowed other players to pick it up because the team attack was more important than people playing their specific positions. So that's brilliant from how they attacked it. Caleb, thank you much for joining me on Talking Tactics this week. We'll be back with you again next week. So that was Talking Tactics. Thank you to James and Caleb for putting that section together this week. And just like the press box, we'll be taking a trip back to some of the key tactical moments throughout the Six Nations as the rounds progress. But now what we're going to do is take a look at some of the standout moments in a section that we are calling the Abbey Wow Moment of the Week, named so because of the walking, talking highlights reel that is England winger Abby Dow. She had a huge amount of phenomenal tries during the World Cup and just about every other game that she has competed in as well. So it seems only fitting that we've named this section after her. So the three of you have found three of the best moments across the opening weekend. Uh, Imogen, what have you found for us this week? I think for me, it's got to be Duan van der Merwe's first try. I could have picked either, but I went for the first. 55-metre um, run, I think he beat numerous uh, tacklers. Also, a point for me that stood out was when Van Portfleet went in to tackle him after that, he switched the ball to his other hand to mm. hand off Don Brandt, which I think was just, when you're running at that pace, to be able to take in the game like that as well, just really impressed me. And I think it's one of the tries that will go down in history. It will go down in history, but Caleb, you don't think it's the moment of the week? Yeah, I don't, because he had a lot of assistance from poor English tacklers. Like, <laughs> Don Brandt was standing upright trying to tackle a South African winger, and we know how that goes for Scottish English. winger. Scottish. Uh, okay. <laughs> I've picked Marcus Smith, um, the Max Malins try. They were attacking, he was flat on the line. He saw that space was closing down. If he had given that pass as a chance for an intercept, the presence of mind to change the ball, put on the boot, perfectly waited for Malins to regather and score that try. That's so good heads up rugby and not playing to the template, which is what you need from a fly half. Under that pressure in terms of defense, we've seen what line speed can do to many fly halves. And that didn't bother him at all. So that's my moment of the week. And James, you disagree with both of them and think the moment of the week actually came in Rome. I think it did. Uh, and I, it was another crossfield, actually, uh, this time from Romain and Tamak across to winger De Mortier in about the 26th minute. Uh, this is their third try that they scored. At this point, uh, they looked like they were about to score 50. They were absolutely <laughs> cruising. And obviously, Italy upset them. But again, as we always like to see with a crossfield, it's always about the fact that the winger doesn't even have to break stride. Now, I think your one was probably, it was more of an impulse. It wasn't really a, a set play. This one was definitely a set play. You could see Demorti out there in in the in the space, uh, and Intermac hit him absolutely perfectly. So maybe his is more of an impulse one, but mine is just a perfectly executed bit of skill. Interesting, but of course, Duhan he was all about individual skill. Imogen, do you not think though that if you're going to have the moment of the week, you've got to have a nice big kick in it? No, don't think so. That's that one sorted. <laughs> yeah, and. Um, and of course, it was one of one of two tries that, that Duhan scored. The second one was a far more team-based yeah. mm. try going from literally one side of the pitch, then back to the back to the left hand side. You see, this is the moment of the week. We can't bring in he scored a brilliant second try, but we can't bring that in. We've got to look at that first try. Just individually. Yeah. Well, I think the narrative around the fact that it is, I think, the greatest individual try in the Calcutta Cup, and I think the greatest individual try in the Six Nations uh, certainly weighs in its favour. I think it does. Um, just to, I'm not actually sure if I can argue my end, to be honest. I, like, I, I want to put, put my one out there, but it was such an incredible try. Uh, don't, I don't think I can, to be honest. Yeah, I, I think it was a good try, but I've never seen such poor tackling at that standard. 
in the sense that he shouldn't be doing that in, <laughs> in, in an international game, playing against such a quality English side whose defense coach is Sir Kev. I, I don't think he does that, but he's new one. He did it, and hey, he's South African. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to play the Scottish card in this one. I'm going to claim Duhan van der Merwe's first try as the Abbey Wow moment of the first round of the Six Nations. Congratulations, Duhan. You're at... Uh, Prizes in the post mm. that we'll get with you at, uh, at some point. But it's stage. coming from Edinburgh, obviously, so not, it's long to, not, not, not too far away, not exactly. Far yeah. Unless they're in Spain again, then it might be fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> Send us some sun cream. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't need he it. He doesn't need it. He's, he's not got a beautiful <laughs> tan, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our episode this week has been hugely Calcutta Cup focused, of course, because it's the greatest matchup in international <laughs> rugby. But what we're doing now is mixing things up. We're heading out onto the streets of Twickenham and we spoke to some of the England and Scottish fans after that game on Saturday night. It was a proper game of rugby, which you don't see many of those these days. And I'm sure that for the Six Nations, we won't see many games as close as that today. And it was really, really close. But Scotland, yeah, they did all right, didn't they? They did really, really well. Well, I think personally I'd like to say thank you for the English to invite us down. Uh, it's always a pleasure to play at Twickenham, but more importantly, it wasn't an unexpected result. It's been building a lot. Uh, I don't think England should panic. Steve Bothwick's a good coach, but today we just showed them maturity and uh, I think we can press on. Incredible. That's the first time we've done it back to back ever. Um, incredible. And I, I don't see any reason why we can't win the whole Six Nations. That's a big, that's a big chat, by the way. But it was a close game. The last 10 minutes were really, really stressful because you didn't know which way it was going. I mean, I carry, I carry with me a hip flask of whiskey. Yeah. And every time England scored, yeah. I gave the England supporters around me a drink. And I ran out, ran out just after half time because it was so close. But it was brilliant. Yabru, leka leka, how's it? And, uh, and what have you liked? What have you liked particularly about Scotland squad this year? He's actually picking players on form for once. That's that's more of Townsend's shout. That's Matt Captain. That's Matt Captain. He's actually actually picking players on form, and the squad's looking good actually. And what have you thought about Jimmy Richards, Captain? It's on. It's all game today. Doesn't have to do anything too wild. He just needs to lead twice, which is exactly what he's doing. So. He doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to be a world beater. Just. And, and, and finally, just on Steve Borthwick, what do you think he can do to England? I think they need a wee bit of rejuvenation. I mean, as a Scotland fan, I, I don't really care what's happening to them, but it's good to, well, they need a bit of a revamp. So I think he'll do that. So good, so good. Can we bring Eddie Jones back? Yeah! yeah. 100%, 100%. 100%. 100%. Who was the worst player on the field for England today? Oh, Owen Farrell. I feel like I should have played and I would have won. I would have made up England won. Alright, we're going to say. I'm Scotland, I think, lost little by... Yeah! England were poor most of the time, but Scotland, to be fair, were sharper better and quicker, um, instantly. And um, what were you expecting from a steep one for England? A lot better, a lot more, a lot more. They were poor, one out, one out passing, one out rugby, crap. School kids do better. England were under power, too many mistakes, wasn't it? Did you enjoy your day? Yeah, 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 yeah that's good. Yeah, yeah. Were you a lot more impressed today than you were under Eddie? Was I what? A lot more impressed with England today than under Eddie. I don't think there's any difference. You don't think there's any difference? No. no. We're on the same team, wasn't it? Yeah? Yeah. A slightly different team, maybe. Well, slightly, yeah, but yeah. through injuries, maybe, but I, I didn't, think they, didn't think they played particularly well. No? No. No. That's a shame. <laughs> My opinion is that Owen Farrell should not be the captain. He should really step down and play rugby 
and shouldn't have that pressure on him. He's not a captain's captain, and if they, England keep on uh, having him as a captain, they will never ever win the World Cup. And that's what I think today. I'm a Springbok supporter, and as long as Owen Farrell is the captain, I think everybody, all other countries have a shot at the World Cup. You've got to remember that this is rugby. And when you play rugby, it doesn't matter if you win or lose. It's whether or not you have a really good game. And today was a really good game. I don't know if you can see the changes that have come over me. So a huge thank you to the fans in and around Twickenham on Saturday night for that fantastic content. There were some brilliant lines, wonderful characters, and I'm sure we'll do it again at some point over the championship. But now, before we wrap up, we'll take a quick look ahead to fixtures that are coming up in just a few days' time. And James, we'll start with the Ireland-France game that is taking place in Dublin. People are tipping it as one of the best games we're going to have in this championship. How are you seeing it? Yeah, the first game of the weekend. And realistically, this is probably the Grand Slam decider. I think, anyway. Whoever wins I mean, this, I, I agree with you. I don't at least whoever wins this has the best chance, I think, of going mm. on to win the Grand Slam. Obviously, for France, it's very difficult because they've got more away games. But, you know, on the flip side of things, since Andy Farrell has come in as Ireland coach, he's played France three times. He's lost three times. And that's a record that staring down the barrel of it, going home, uh, is going to be difficult mm. to, to maintain. Let's see how they do. Obviously, Ireland, they have no Thurlong, they have no Gibson Park, they have no Kean Healy. Uh, Johnny Sexton, I think, is still teetering on the edge of fitness within HIA. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be an absolute cracker. Who wins? Ah, my heart says France, my head says Ireland, but I'm going to go with France. That's going to be my call. Big call. Speaking of big calls, Caleb, Wales are making a trip up to Edinburgh to face Scotland. Uh, now, the typical Scotland would have just won the Kolkata Cup and now just go and bottle it against this Wales side. Is that how you envisage it playing out? No, because the typical Scotland always gets bullied, even though they win some games, like even the Kolkata Cup, they would win it, and then you'd see that they struggled a bit up front, didn't get enough gain line. But they did this time around. When they looked like they were getting their foot off the pedal and they were trailing, they make substitutions, guys like Chris Harris are on the bench. So it's a different Scottish side. And they didn't have Hamish Watson. We also didn't have one of the fixtures we'd love to see in that team. Ali Price didn't play. So they're building some great depth mm. in that squad. I don't think they crumble at Murrayfield. I think they actually get Gatland and his boys because I don't think Wales have an answer. They look like a team that's just, we're just here to make sure the Six Nations finishes and we're all right. Um, so, so Scotland's Grand Slam campaign rolls on? I don't think they campaign for the Grand Slam, but I think they finish second <laughs> because I think France or Ireland take the Grand Slam and they'll need to beat one of those two to even get a second. But I do think they beat a world side which is lacking of confidence and doesn't know what kind of rugby it wants to play, especially considering that Scotland has, has been building so much depth and their attack looks very sharp with Finn Russell fizzing those passes out wide. They look like a team that's going to do a job against a world side at Murrayfield. I like your talk. I'm a big <laughs> fan of that. And finally, Imogen, we have England playing host to Italy, a game that you are returning to in the press box. How do you see it unfolding? I'm looking forward to this one. I think before the championship started and before Italy put that performance in against France, I would have thought I was an easy win for England, but I don't think it's going to be easy. I think it's going to be a good contest between the two teams. Um, Henry Arundel's been called up to Steve Borthwick's squad, so it'd be interesting to see the pace he can bring um, if he if he plays. Henry Slade also been called up again. Could this be? I know we're going to talk about it, but could this be a, an option as well? <laughs> uh, could we maybe see Farrell or Smith on the bench? Who knows? Uh, Caden Murley's been released, and so is Guy Porter, so we won't be seeing them uh, train at all this week um, or start at the weekend. Um, England have also dropped down to six in the world rankings, so Scotland overtook them. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Italy, that might be for the first time ever as well. Yeah, yeah, I think Italy, from what we've seen of them last week and for the past year, they can really show that they're up here to compete. And I'd really like to see a competitive game between the two. Um, I, yeah, I'd like to see Italy put up a fight against England and see what they can bring to the party, so to speak. So who wins it? <laughs> England. England. England, the call in their game against Italy to wrap up 
What will be round two of the Six Nations? Rugby's greatest championship has well and truly returned. We had three unbelievable games to open the tournament this past weekend. And the TW2 team will be covering all of the action across the next few weeks of this tournament. A huge thank you must go to our producers behind the camera, Alex and Ruben. But that will bring an end to this episode of the one-off EH12 podcast. The TW2 will be back in action next week. But until then, see you later.